Good leadership doesn't just lead to better results. It creates a quality journey. It, it enhances the journey along the way. And it also enriches the lives of everyone else around it during that journey. Leading well is a solemn responsibility. It's an important responsibility. And it should scare you a little bit. In fact, you know, at least enough so that you bring your A game wherever you're going. If you are so privileged to, to lead an organization, you know, you, you want to make sure that, that you're, uh, you're at the top of your game in whatever you do. Our nation ne needs you and needs your ability to communicate and lead now more than ever. So what are the goals for tonight? I um, <clears throat> wanted to look at uh, the goals for tonight. So I'd like to introduce and discuss the concept of consensus building. It's not really a new concept, but uh, we'll discuss the definition. And then how we at the Civic Council build consensus or work to build consensus both within the organization and outside of that in a public process. And then lastly, you know, the questions always come up, well, what can I do? Well, what you can do is work on yourself. And there are certain key attributes that you should think about and focus on every day um, and in all of your interactions. And so we'll talk about those. But why is consensus building important? Let's just, let's talk about that. Well, there is a, um, we know that that we get superior results from a process after, after people are involved. Um, there's compromise along the way, but when everyone else is involved, you know, some, everyone has a stake in the outcome. And although I, I, uh, you're going to hear a lot of quotes tonight, um, and, and it's an opportunity to do things with rather than to people. Um, and so, while this is not exactly on point, it's close enough. Um, and although it's a little bit sexist, you can understand that the perspective is important. This is from um, Dwight Eisenhower. He said he'd rather try to persuade a man to go along because once he's persuaded him, he's going to stick. He's going to stick with him. But if I scare him, he's just going to stay as long as he's scared, and then he's going to go. So, you know, to Eisenhower's point, once consensus is reached, people tend to stick around. They have a stake in it, and, and not just because they've had an opportunity to be heard. Um, it's uh, be, having the opportunity to be heard, especially right now, is probably more important than, than ever. And um, I don't know about what you've experienced in the last 12 months, but in my world, um, those events have really strained a lot of, they've created deep divisions, they've strained relationships that I had never thought before would be strained in, in a million years. Um, emotions are running high, relationships can be frayed or broken. And navigating those personal and professional activities is difficult um, and, we, and, and challenging. And why does this happen? Well, this happens because people want to be heard. Um, they have deeply held convictions and they want to express those convictions. And whether we agree with others or not, when we discuss civil discourse, we're going to discuss that some this evening, it's really important to understand that each individual deserves to be heard and that what they have to say is valuable and to recognize that when you're working through a leadership process or in, a, in any context to understand that, that they have value in their, in their contribution. Um, and, that, and I will promise you that the end result in any case in which you bring diverse voices together, you will have a much better, stronger end result with people who will stick to it um, and work through it. So these days, however, there seems to be a void in that area, admittedly. Um, and one obstacle, though, to... Uh, to you know, to, to really listening into consensus building is that we all as human beings have a, have a, you know, by human nature, we want to affiliate and associate with people we know, people who are like us, who agree with us, who, and, and, and this has a name. I mean, it's been cited in many leadership studies. It's called confirmation bias. And I'm sure you've, you've heard that in many of your, in many of your um, studies, but you know what I'm talking about. It's just a natural human tendency to want to, to talk with people who think like you do. But I will tell you and I'll submit to you that important endeavors require diverse input. General George Patton said, if everyone is thinking alike, and then someone isn't thinking. Right? And that's right, look, right. And that's from the military, right? Where they want they think they want you to think alike. So we you know when we preach to the choir, all we create is an echo chamber. And that adds no value to the ultimate conversation. Another obstacle is, uh, is good listening skills, really active listening skills, listening to someone, putting down your phone, taking away any other distractions, and looking at someone and listening and hearing them. Too often, we're not listening. 
Um, and I know it sounds a little bit you know, like it's from kindergarten, but you know, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Uh, and so you know, when we have confirmation bias, we have emotion and just plain old apathy, many of us just don't hear what someone else is saying. So in this process and as a leader, you have to be sensitive to and you have to bring active listening skills and also be sensitive to the subtext, to what else are they saying? What's their motivation? Why are they? And try to, to bring that out from them. With all of that said, I do not have answers to um, all of the deep divisions that exist today. My hope is that I can frame out an approach for you that you can add to your toolkit when, and so that when you're in the midst of controversy, it's a tool um, that you can use to move your team forward. It may not always work, and you will not please all of the people all of the time, nor should that be your goal. But I hope that this adds a different and a diverse um, perspective. So, going back to what is consensus. Um, how many of you have heard of the social change model consensus building? Yeah, a few? Yeah, very safe. Oh, yeah, pretty good. Okay. Social change model. So some of you have heard of it. As a lawyer, I like to start with the plain meaning of words because lawyers are, you know, we deal in words as our currency. So consensus, this is a little elementary, but we're going to move through this, is just a general agreement. Consensus building is a collaborative problem-solving approach. So you as a leader are a problem solver. That may be a kind of a new concept to think about as a leader. And you're essentially mediating conflicting um, co conflicting um, uh, conflict between parties, and usually this comes up with um, it, it's con it, pardon me it's conflict in a in a very in very complex issues that tend to be interdisciplinary. So you know you'll have a conflict between someone who's a sociology major and a finance major and a political science major, and they're not going to see the same. But what do they have in common? So that is the um, that's the general overall. Um, on social, uh, on social change, however, social change model of consensus building, I think only recently in the last few decades they've actually tried to name this, but leaders have been doing this for a long time. You have Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, and one of my favorites, Harry Truman. They've all practiced some form of leadership and social change leadership in, a, in this model, whether, we, whether they knew it or not. But looking at the social change leadership model and that um, for consensus building, I think it's important that we pick out a few of the definitions and, and look at it. It's not stagnant. It is a process. It's dynamic and collaborative. And much of what I'll discuss with you in some of the examples is about process. And there's a reason for that because it is a process and it takes a long time. Um, and the foundation of the process, however, is relationships. It's relationships and connections to others. And the goal of the process, obviously, in this case, is positive social change. So whoever, so when we're talking about the goals of Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King or Harry Truman or whoever that is, they had, their goal was positive social change. And, and they worked through a process in each of those cases. So what makes all of this work? Well, you can bring diverse individuals together um, to solve a problem. The only reason it works is because every individual in that group, in that setting, whether it's a team you're working on in class, everyone has a goal of getting an A. You all have the same goal or a common purpose, even if you have disparate opinions. And we value, and whenever we have a, whenever we have a process, we try to stick to a number of values, like core components that no matter what we do in that process, we're going to keep a few things around. And the first thing is, we're always going to remember during the process that we can agree to disagree, that there will be um, adversity and there will be controversy, but we're okay with that. We're comfortable with it, and we're not going to be personally offended. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. There's collaboration. Collaboration sometimes is confused with compromise. It's both. It's not, an, it's, it's not the same, but it's both. There's also a number of personal traits that I'll go over. But the, the, the personal traits to keep in mind for this point are self-knowledge and self-awareness, which sometimes is these days called emotional intelligence, citizenship or your willingness to serve, and the concept of being a servant leader is something we'll discuss also, 
as well as your commitment. What is your personal passion? What is it, why are you in this? And that gets back to what do you want to change and what is the social change you're looking for. So does this all sound like a lot of work already? It is, it is. Um, and so does this sound like you know what a leader does, a problem solver? Not everyone thinks of that, of that a leader is like this hands-on person that's gonna you know, dig in, but that's what this is. Consensus building is difficult to achieve. It takes time and effort. It takes humility and it takes compromise as you lead a team through a decision-making process. But the leader who builds consensus success successfully has to learn a few things. You have to learn to listen. You have to learn to find common ground. And you have to learn to embrace ideas that are not your own. Be comfortable with that. One example that some of you may be familiar with, others of you may, have, may not have been born yet, um, was, is the Better Jacksonville Plan. So your president, uh, John Delaney, was then Mayor Delaney. And in 2000, and even before that, as he was into his second term, you know, he knew that, and his staff knew that they wanted to create new things for Jacksonville, improve roads, improve sewer connections, and, um, and infrastructure, and build capital projects like a ball field and a library, and all of these different great things. But how are you going to do that when you don't have a funding source? Moreover, how, and, and the state law says you have to get a referendum of, into, of your voters, of your citizens, to vote in favor of that. And the thought of taxing ourselves $2.2 billion at the time was heretical, frankly. And he had pollsters who said, you're not going to do it. You, it's, you, he did. I mean, you can ask him about it. But he wanted to do that. But what he did before he ever went public with it is he spent a long time building stakeholders, building and talking to stakeholders. Because people on the north side don't want the same thing as people on the south side. And people on the west side at Cecil Commerce Center are not sure they want a downtown library. So, you know, you have to look at what was in it for every single person. And, and how do you build that consensus so that on election day, they came out and they voted in favor of it. Even if they didn't agree with all of it, they agreed with some of it. And they knew it was to move the city forward. And as most of you know, that was ultimately quite successful. And we have some amazing capital projects and infrastructure um, to, um, to, uh, to attribute to the, um, to the Better Jacksonville Plan. So let's discuss next why this type of leadership is important. I mentioned before that better decisions come out when you empower people and have multiple perspectives. You want people in a team who are fully engaged and who stick around with you for implementation, who stay with you. You get organizational buy-in, even in very difficult decisions, because at the end of the day, if you have to make a difficult decision, you want your team with you. Even if they don't all agree, but you want them, you want them with you. So effective communication is about what and why the decision was made. Right now, I'm going to shift to an organization that in some ways, not in all ways, in some ways epitomizes many of the, this type of leadership. And I'm honored to lead and I'm privileged enough to lead the Jacksonville Civic Council. It was founded in 2010 and I've been there since 2013. I'm gonna run through a short video for you that kind of that takes you through what and who the Civic Council is and then we're gonna go through what makes it work and, and we're also going to discuss a few examples of, um, of issues and consensus building in the city. So, alrighty. So the Jacksonville Civic Council, as I said, I've been um, honored and, and privileged to be a part of this organization for, for over three years. What I'd like to do is describe to you the organization and then I'm going to walk you through at least one example of consensus building both within but really in outside in the, in the public process. Um, so um, we have, our membership is made up of 72 CEOs. There are 72 CEOs of the largest and most influential employers in the city of Jacksonville. There are literally hundreds of thousands of employees are represented by our members um, with an over annual $3 billion dollar payroll impact, okay? They're all accomplished civic and business leaders. They have different strengths. They have different opinions. They're very strongly held different opinions. And then they also have competing demands for their time and their resources. So why would they do this? Right? Why would they 
form an organization, assess themselves dues, hire staff, commit time, commit resources. Why? It's one reason. And it gets back to that social change model. It's because they have a common purpose. And you saw the common purpose in the video, and I'm not going to read this to you because you already, you've heard it, but they've focused around a common purpose. But as I mentioned before, whenever you have a common purpose, you still have to have certain values that no matter what you do and no matter what you take on, you hold those values true in your process. So we'll go through a, a few of our core values, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to read through all of them, I'm just going to pull out a few that are particularly relevant to this, pro to this particular talk. And that's collaboration. So right up there on the first one is consensus building with other organizations throughout the region, but also within the organization. Because as I mentioned, these are very diverse individuals. So it's collaboration externally and internally. Leadership, having a voice, taking a voice, focus. We don't focus on, we only focus on a few issues because we don't have a lot of bandwidth because our idea is we're not going to be all things to all people. I'll get calls periodically. Hey, are you guys going to weigh in on the Lyft Uber issue? No, we're not, because there's a bunch of people doing that. But who's not doing or working on maybe the human rights ordinance? Or what? how best can we leverage what we're doing? So we focus on just a few issues and go long and deep on those issues. We look at, at broad, a broad constituency, and that means when we're seeking solutions, we do the research, and then we look at solutions that will impact the, be the most people, Right? So that's going to, and then we're going to, so it's going to benefit residents, businesses, at every level of the community, and then we engage them at the appropriate time. It'll be economic opportunity, humility. And this gets back to Harry Truman's quote, and that is, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're not worried about who gets the credit. And this is an essential part of, of the Civic Council, because each member, as I mentioned, they don't have to be there. They don't need resume filler. They're there because they care. But they're also asked, politely, to check their ego out the door and their agenda out the door because they're, we're all focusing on certain core issues, right? Doesn't always happen, but it's, but it's uh, fun to watch. And then transparency <laughs> and accountability. So we try to use our research when we come forward with our research, which we don't always do, but when we come forward with it, we're completely transparent about how we arrived at that decision. It's fact-based. It is with measurable outcomes. And then advocacy. Because our opinion is, if we're, we're only going to take it on if we can actually effect change. If we can actually take it on and do something about it. If we can't change it, then we're not going to take it on. So we have two examples. I'm, I'm just in being sensitive to time. There is pension reform. And I'd like to say this about pension reform because it's still going on. This started even before 2013, but we started, we engaged in 2013. It really started in 2009 under Mayor Payton the JCCI, but it's going on even today. And the important thing for you to know, pardon me, about pension reform is that it has been an organic, dynamic process of consensus building, and it continues to this day. And there will be even more consensus building by, um, by the Civic Council, by other groups, because not only are the facts changing, I mean, I think we all agree, and for most of you, you may already know this, but you know, the city was in pretty much a going out of business model with a $2.6 billion unfunded liability when roughly 30% uh, of its annual budget of a $1 billion budget is focused on, um, on just paying the minimum required for pension. By the year 2020, and this is not, you know, this is not rainbows, but this is like around the corner. By the year 2020, it's going to reach 40, close to 40 million, uh, excuse me, 40% um, of the $1 billion city budget. So it's not millions of years in the future like the sun, you know, going supernova. It's not theoretical. It's not even the subject of disagreement like climate change. This is a fact. We know we have a problem. And if we do nothing, we're in big trouble, right? We know that. And that's part of what makes it's not easy, but at least we all agree we have a problem. How we get there, well, that's a different story. So Mayor Brown originally had a proposal. He negotiated a proposal, came to us and asked for our blessing. We took it upon ourselves to analyze it. We, we engage subject matter experts. So every task force we have that analyzes something, actually we, we bring in experts. We didn't have anybody who knew about pensions, but one of our members did. And they literally loaned us that individual. And he's even still working to this day on the issue with us. 
um, but someone who could, so we had experts from finance and business and legal and someone who could look at public accounting and actuarial records, all sorts of things that we didn't, you know, we didn't, we couldn't know, but that we brought in the expertise so that we could know. And then we, we came out with recommendations and said, Mayor Brown, your proposal doesn't go far enough. They didn't like that. So although we say we're nonpartisan, suddenly in his opinion we became partisan. But we re recommended a funding solution, we recommended, recommended dramatic changes to pension benefits, and we asked City Council to vote that particular pension deal down and to go back to the drawing board. And that's what happened. That's what happened after a lot of work. But then the mayor established the Retirement Reform Task Force, something called the, that you may have heard called the Shy Task Force, named after its chair, Bill Shy. So here's another consensus building opportunity and process. The Pew Charitable Trust came in and literally contributed over $1 million worth of their time and resources and support to help us work through this process. We had at least five members of the Civic Council on that task force. That task force was also representative of very, very different parts of the community, from the police and fire pension fund, policemen, firemen, those who would be beneficiaries, those who are in the public. So it was all of these folks came together and they updated our analysis. They updated their analysis, we updated our analysis. So remember that this is a process. So at any given time, there were um, opportunities to, to update our knowledge and our thinking along the way. So, in the meantime, there were six to seven different proposals that came forward. Each one wasn't quite there. By 2015, there was finally a funding, there was a, at least a benefit reform solution. And as you know, we kept the pressure on, not just us, but the Jack's Chamber and others, we kept the pressure on in the, in the, in the city council elections and in the mayoral elections. And we made sure that, if, that those individuals understood that our first priority for them, when they get in office, was finding a solution to pension. Because it's the cloud, it's the thing that blocks out the sun for the rest of us and for any other issue going forward. Mayor Curry is elected. What's one of the first things he does? He goes to the legislature and asks for a special tax, the ability to special tax. And then he goes for a referendum. Because the one problem with all of these solutions that have come forward is that there is no funding solution. Well, he got it passed, as most of you know. But there is still more work to be done, and now you know that there are, there are four different agreements. Yes, he will close, close defined benefits, pensions, for the city of Jacksonville. If he does this, I suspect he'll be on the mayor on the cover of Time Magazine, but has to get it, obviously, through city council. And then we will have both a funding source and revised benefits. It's going to be expensive, we, we suspect, and we will come out and we'll analyze it and then move forward. But it is a pivotal time. And my point through all of this is this takes a long time. And it's challenging. And you're not always going to agree. But you have to keep going back to what your common purpose is. What's the common purpose? What's the common goal? And how are you going to get there? And what you'll find is that others want to do the same thing. Something you're more familiar with, I suspect, is the Human Rights Ordinance and the recent activity in the Human Rights Ordinance. As many of you probably know, the Jacksonville Human Rights Ordinance you know, covers um, and pro prohibits discrimination from certain protected classes. We did not have a, in, in a pr our protected classes lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals. Back in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2012 an ordinance came forward to, to the city council um, and it was an LGB ordinance. That failed. We were highly engaged in, in the middle of that. We polled our members, we came forward, we took out all full page ads, hired lobbyists, did everything we could, and the measure failed by one vote, 10 to 9. In the meantime, a lot changed in the world. But during that time, there was a regular drumbeat of community leaders who were talking to other community leaders. And then comes around the 2015 election for city council and for the mayor. And we, and the Jack's Chamber and others, made sure that along with pension, the Human Rights Ordinance was up there in the priorities. That whoever was going to be elected was going to address that. We wanted to make sure they understood that was important to us because it's important to the community. So what did Mayor Curry do? He didn't want to, but he convened a number of sessions last year, community meetings. And I don't know if some of you attended them. They were very heavily attended. 
There, there was a vitriol and disagreement, and, but he brought together folks from every aspect of the issue to hear and to, and to raise their voices, to, to bring forward div divergent viewpoints. And at the end of the, and at the same time, there was also a bill going through. That bill was ultimately withdrawn uh, for, for a variety of reasons. It was a competing bill by uh, Councilmember Belliford for a referendum, and we all agreed that we wanted to focus on pension tax referendum, and this was not the time. So at the beginning of 2016, that bill was withdrawn. But between the first quarter, second quarter of 2016, through the end of 2016, a small group of community leaders representing the LGBT community, the Equality Jacks, the legal community, the business community, lots of people. They went out and what we learned from those community meetings, what we learned is that people have very, very, they have very strongly held beliefs, but there were some good points. This is an undue burden on small business. And other, other cities have an exemption for small businesses. It might have been an undue burden for, for personal service providers. That was an option. But what we heard most of all was that the faith community felt as though they were being persecuted in their own faith. Now that's the last thing anybody wants to do because religious affiliation is also a protected class. But without those community conversations, without listening and really hearing what they were saying, they didn't want to be persecuted in their own churches or for going to church. But that is how they felt. Whether it was right or wrong, that's how they felt. So the bill that we brought forward included a religious exemption. And that's consistent with federal law. And it's a simple thing, but it's not. It became a big thing. And what that, those measures, including a small business exemption and a religious exemption did, so we heard the concerns, you built them into the bill, it is a much better bill, and it was ultimately passed by a supermajority of the city council. Not without a fight. And as you probably know, if you read today's paper, there, there's a, a lawsuit that was just filed. That fight will continue, and we'll continue to advocate for it. But my point in all of this is this is a very long process. You have to listen to people maybe that you don't agree with. You want to hear them. Give them that respect and opportunity to be heard as you go through this. So now, imagine yourself. You're a leader. You've gone through your training. You're in the middle of all of this, in the middle of a very polarizing conversation. What do you do? What do you do? What can you as an individual do? How do you do it? And my message to you is it really begins with you and ends with you in how you conduct yourself. So again, maybe going back to grade school, but these are important characteristics and personal traits that you can work on throughout your career. There's personal integrity, and some people say, you know, that's like that's what you do when no one's looking. But it's important because what is going to, you know, how is someone going to trust you? Why would someone trust you to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to hear you, and then I'm going to work on trying to, you know, build a solution or help me build a solution? There's emotional intelligence. That's that phrase again. And if you haven't read much about it, I'd recommend that you read about it. Um, and self-awareness. Know thyself, you know, the uh, inscriptions at Delphi. Active listening, we've talked about active listening, and that's really listening to someone. And what I remember what we said about hearing and listening in the subtext. Trust. That means you have to trust others, even if you don't agree with them, even if they don't look like you or act like you, even if they're not from your, you know, echo chamber, you have to do that because you want them to trust you and you have to act in a way that will build trust and build respect. And part of this is, and going back to trust, is let me just say, we're all going to mess up. We're all going to screw up. We're all going to fail. We're all going to make a mistake along the way. We might say something or do something that someone misunderstands and, and you didn't mean it that way. Or maybe you said something and you really didn't, you go look back and you say, gosh, I shouldn't have said that. The most important thing about that is that you take ownership of it and responsibility for it if you hide from it, you're not building respect or trust. You're just building disrespect, you're building questions about your own credibility and your own personal integrity. So know that failure is part of success, but own it and just and work through it. Humility, we've talked about humility. 
A lot of people think about the autocratic version of leadership. This is a very humbling task. Courage. I think that speaks for itself. But not everyone has that. And then creativity. Listen, when you listen to folks, figuring out what their common ground is, looking at what other cities have done, and coming up with a solution that's right for your city or your environment. So all of this, all of these traits that probably sound familiar to you, because they're part of servant leadership, and I'm certain that that's something that you have all learned um, through your, in your experiences. And as you can tell, leading someone through consensus is not for the faint of heart, and it's certainly not for immediate gratification, right? It's going to take a while. But it is a way to work through and to reach a widely acceptable, workable solution for, for a group. The benefit, even though it's protracted and even agonizing in many cases, is that once the consensus is reached, the shareholders stick to it. So there's that stick to itness, if you will, that we heard from Eisenhower. You know, you want people, because we're in this together, we want to live in this city together. There's always going to be people who oppose the HRO, but can we try to achieve the most consensus possible so we can live in peace and frankly move on and address other issues that are, that are, that are confronting us? So before I close, I'd like to touch on civility and discourse. Because I talked about it, the importance of listening earlier, but it's also important for a leader to be able to express his or her feelings and thoughts and even extreme disagreement in a respectful and courteous manner. It's not always easy to do and as I mentioned in the HRO battle over years, um, to this day the mayor is getting hate mail and hate tweets and all of that. But it's essential to consensus leadership. It is absolutely essential. And I'd like to encourage you to begin practicing it in your classrooms, in your, in your homes. This gets back to courage, to saying, to speaking your voice. You know, we hear a lot about safe zones on campuses. Well, what about a not safe zone? What about a, a zone where you can say what's not safe? But respect that someone is not saying it to offend you, it's because what they, it's what they believe. Now think about that for a moment. So my advice to you is to really get involved. I interviewed some of our members before I was preparing this, and repeatedly it's to get involved. Get involved wherever you are. Work on those traits. Do get involved with your with with um, your your um, with the city. There is so much gridlock, and as, as we all know, at the federal and the state level, the local level is the true opportunity to actually effect positive change. There is an actual opportunity here. And surround yourself with people who possess the qualities, those qualities, not the echo chamber, but the qualities. So you can have someone who possesses personal integrity, but they may not, they may not agree with you, and that's okay. Talk with them. Agree to disagree. I'd like to leave you last with one of my favorite passages. It's from Theodore Roosevelt. And I think this sum summarizes for me, and I've looked at this for mo most of my life because it's been hanging on the wall, my family's home. But, you know, we can all criticize the process and we can all criticize others who are engaging in the process. There's a lot to criticize out there. But that's not what's important because everybody's going to stumble, everybody's going to fall. But the one who is actually trying, the one who has the courage to speak up and to speak their voice, and the other person has the courage and ability to listen, to actively listen, those are the people who matter. And that's, the, that's what you want to take away. People who have great enthusiasm, they have great devotions and passions. They spend their life in pursuit of a worthy cause. And we don't always get to do that. But when you have to respect someone who is doing that, even if you don't agree with how they're doing it, listen. So at the end of the day, it's not so much the people who are you know, who are experiencing those, um, the triumph of high achievement. It's the one who tries and fails, but chooses to dare greatly. So I, I ask each of you to dare greatly in whatever you're doing. And I thank you.